We've made it to section four, advanced OpenGL, and looking first now at example 1.2, depth testing view. What we see here in the scene is that for every pixel, what we're displaying is its depth value, a grayscale value in the range of zero to one, where we get zero black for pixels that are on the near clipping plane, one full white for pixels on the far clipping plane, and everything else is proportional in between. So we're effectively visualizing the Z values of our pixels. As you can see, as I move away, things get wider until they get cut off by the far clipping plane. And as they get closer, they will get darker. To achieve this effect in the fragment shader, there are multiple solutions. Here I have three. Each of them computes a depth value, here depth one, depth two, and depth three. And then we take that depth value, which is a value between zero and one, and we set the frag color to have the RG and B all equal to that depth value. So we get a grayscale value. The first solution is, I think, both the easiest and the simplest. We are simply from the fragment shader getting the view space coordinate of the pixel, get that Z component, and because in OpenGL the camera looks down the negative Z axis in the distance, Z values get more negative. So we want to flip its sign. And to find where that value lies in the range of near to far, we subtract out near and divide it by far minus near, and now we have a value between zero and one that reflects the depth of that pixel. In solution two, it's a bit more complicated, but now we don't need view position. Instead, we're using Z of screen space, which we get in the special variable GL frag chord. And so with this, we simply work backwards. We first uh, compute the NDC equivalent of our screen space Z by multiplying by two and subtracting out one. We then go back from NDC to clip space by dividing by the W of screen space, frag chord dot W. Because if you recall, in clip space, we set the W value to be the negative Z of view space, but then in the conversion to NDC, the W value becomes one over that W, and that then is copied verbatim to screen space. So the Z value of clip space gets divided by the W of clip space to get us to NDC, but now in screen space, we have one over W. So to go backwards, instead of multiplying by W, we actually divide it because it's actually one over the W of clip space. And so that gets us the Z of clip space. And now to find the depth value, it's simply a question of where does Z clip lie in the range of negative near to positive far. So we add in the near and then divide near plus far, getting us a value that should be between zero and one. So note the fundamental issue here. The Z we have in screen space is not linear to the Z's of view space, because when we go from clip space to NDC, the Z's are all divided by the W. In solution two, we're fixing that by undoing that division effectively. In solution one, we just don't have this problem because we're dealing with Z before the perspective division. Solution three is the solution offered on learnopengl.com. It's the original author's solution. And like solution two, it also starts by finding the Z of NDC, seen here. But strangely, it doesn't involve any division by the W, but it does still get us a Z value that is linear to view space. This here gets us a value in the range of near to far, and then we simply divide by far to get our depth value. I honestly can't explain exactly why this works, but if we do a spot check for values of Z NDC, here, if we assume our near value is one and our far value is 10, well, for this actually should be negative one, for negative one, the smallest possible NDC value, you get one, which is equivalent to our near clipping plane value, which is what we should expect. For positive one, we get 10, which is equal to our far plane. But then for values in between, notice that the mapping is not linear. Negative 0.5 is 1.3, zero gets us 1.9, 0 0.5 gets us 3.1. So you can see that it is effectively undoing the nonlinear transformation from clip space to NDC. I looked around and couldn't find a good explanation for why it works this way. So I'd be interested if anyone can point to a proper proof for this. Anyway, it can be shown to work properly if here we set the output to what we get from depth three, and then I rebuild, run it again, and we get what looks indistinguishable to me. What we see here in example two is a use of the stencil buffer. The stencil buffer is a per pixel buffer like the depth buffer 
that is usually on most platforms 8 bits in size, and so it stores integer values from 0 to 255. And what we can do with the stencil buffer is enable a stencil test whereby for each pixel, we compare a value with what's already in the stencil buffer for that pixel. And if the test passes, only then do we draw into the frame buffer. Otherwise, we discard the pixel. And so what's happening here is we've drawn first the floor here as normal. But then when we draw the textured boxes, the gray boxes you see, for those pixels, we wrote the value 1 into the stencil buffer. And then we draw the boxes again, but we scale them up and use a different shader, this one that just draws a solid color. But the second time we draw the boxes, we apply a stencil test that only passes for pixels where the stencil buffer is not equal to 1. And so effectively, the second time we draw the boxes, it's not overriding the textured boxes the first time we drew. And so you get this outline effect. So now, to work with the stencil buffer, uh, first, you may want to query how large the stencil buffer is on your platform. It's almost always going to be 8 bits, but if you want to be sure, you can use this code to query that. And so here we're printing out the value. It involves querying a parameter of the frame buffer. We haven't talked about frame buffers yet. We'll do that quite soon. But anyway, this is how we get the number of stencil bits. The function stencil op here, as in stencil operation, specifies what happens to the stencil buffer value in the case of the stencil test and depth test either passing or failing. And the first argument here is specifying the action in the event of the stencil test failing. The second argument specifies what we do in the event the stencil test passes, but the depth test fails. And the third argument specifies what to do in the event of both the stencil and depth tests passing, in which case then also the fragment shader will run. So for our purposes, we're going to only want to write to the stencil buffer in the event of both tests passing. So that's why this third argument is replace but otherwise we just want to keep the current value. We don't want to modify it. Now, the value that replaces what's in the buffer, uh, that is specified by another call we'll see later. Down in the render loop, we're going to want to make sure to clear the stencil buffer every frame. So we add in this flag in the call to geo clear, and the function clear stencil specifies what value we clear the stencil buffer to. In this case, we're clearing to zero, which I believe is the default. So now when we draw, first we're drawing the floor, and when we do so, we want to disable any stencil testing because we want the drawing to be unconditional and we don't want to write into the stencil buffer. But then when we draw the cubes, we want to enable stencil testing, not because we want the drawing to be conditional, but because we want to write into the stencil buffer. To specify the value that's written and what the comparison test is, we call stencil func, the first argument specifying the comparison test, in this case, always, meaning that the test passes unconditionally. The other options here are never, equal, not equal, less than, greater than, less than or equal, and greater than equal. But in this case, we just want the test to always pass. And the second argument here is the so-called ref value. This is what's used in the comparisons if we had a comparison function, but it's also the value written into the buffer when our action is GL replace, as we set in the call to stencil op at the top. The third value here is a bit mask argument and in the comparisons between the ref value and the current value in the stencil buffer, both of them get anded with this bit mask before the comparison is performed. Because our comparison function is always, this is effectively irrelevant here, but in other cases, there are scenarios where this could be useful. Anyway, having enabled stencil testing and set up the stencil function, when we now draw the cubes, for each pixel of the cubes, the stencil buffer value is going to get set to 1. And so when we draw the cubes again, after scaling them up and using a different shader to just draw a solid color, now we want a stencil function that only passes for stencil values other than one. So our comparison is not equal and a rough value is still one. And incidentally, for pixels where this passes, where the outline is drawn, the stencil buffer value is going to get set to one, but that doesn't really matter here because immediately next frame, we're going to clear the stencil buffer. So that's not a problem. We could, though, if we wanted, disable writing to the stencil buffer by calling a function named stencil mask, but it's not really necessary here. Anyway, note that because we want the outline drawn on top of everything else, on top of the floor, we're disabling the depth test. After drawing the outline, we just need to make sure to re-enable it down here. So this is just one example of what we can do with the stencil buffer. You can use it in various ways to mask out drawing of certain pixels and achieve various different effects, such as this outline.